something that sounds like a child of two Cause the cat's got your tongue when he's close to you This situation, this indication Means you're in business with a thing called love Hello, Dutch Just make your mind up there's a little present for you guys from the syndicate. Listen, listen, listen. Hello. A couple of guys just got blasted in boot five. Hello, operator. Police headquarters, please. Positively amazing. A couple of guys get murdered in a crowded cafe and nobody sees it. Well, some of the patrons might have seen it. They lammed out of here right after it happened. You know who they were? Mm, not by name, no. Hmm. You're a big help to me, Smitty. Thanks. Let's say here they went right by you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Think if I took you down to Central and showed you a couple of photographs, you could identify them? Well, you see, sir, uh, I was so scared I, I couldn't take my eyes off the guns. I see. Well. Maybe if you people spend a little time as guests of the state, it'll improve your memory, huh? Put them in the cooler, Blake. Yes, sir, Captain. What's the charge? I don't know yet. All right, folks. There's newspaper men in, will you? All right, boys. The captain will see you now. Hello, Captain. Hiya, boys. At 11.05 p.m. tonight, Danny Denton and Dutch Kripe, alleged members of the Bugs Kelly mob, were shot to death here by persons unknown for reasons unknown. That's it, boys. Is that all, Captain? That's all I know. Weren't there any witnesses to the crime? There were. We couldn't find them. They landed before we got here. Well, wasn't that considerate of them? <laughs> See you later. Don't lose your sense of humor, Captain. The job of a crime reporter is just as thankless as yours. <laughs> Guess you're right, Jim. Oh, by the way, who's Bugs Kelly been squeezing lately? How would I know? I thought you and he were palsy wowsy. I get to know all the mugs. That's my business. Uh-huh. Well, next time you see Bugs, just tell him I was inquiring, eh? Okay, so long. <laughs> Okay, let him in, Slim. It's me. Is the big fellow in, Slim? Hi, Jim. Yeah, come on in. Hi, you bugs. Hi, you pal. Long time no see. Yeah. Hello, Lou. Hey, Hi, Jim. Pull up a chair, Jim, and tell me what's on your mind. Have you been stepping on anybody's toes lately? No. Why? I've got bad news for you. A couple of your boys were rubbed out last night at Smitty's Cafe, Vanny and Dutch. Did the coppers tag anybody? A few reluctant witnesses. But Captain Peroni figures you know the answer. Well, it wouldn't be hard to run down the guys who did the job, but... Another crime syndicate killing, huh? What else? They gave me 30 days to join up with them, and the time was up yesterday. What a story that would make if I knew who was back at the syndicate. I wish I knew. You wish you knew? I'd give 10 grand for just one name, and I'm gonna make it my business to find out who pulls the strings for the outfit you call Crime Incorporated in that column of yours. <laughs> Copy of the Daily News? Yes, sir. Refer to page three, column one. Yes, sir. Have you read the story? Yes, sir. You don't find Bucks Kelly's name among the deceased, do you? Mm, no, sir. Well, that's where we want to find it. So make the necessary arrangements. Yes, sir.
pretty criminal lawyer. Mm, isn't he handsome? Is he the one that always wins acquittals for his client? Yes, that's him. And he certainly collects enormous fees. Who says crime doesn't pay? <laughs> <laughs> Him too? Uh huh. In the interest of personal security. Hey, look who's here. Hello, Tony. What's cooking? Some nice roast lamb. Roast lamb, huh? I didn't look at the menu. Kidding aside, I'd like to place a bet for Bob Littell. How much does he want to bet? $5,000. I'll guarantee it. Five grand? Okay. What horses Littell picked for the killing? I'm not circulating any hot tips around here. Give me a book, I'll write it down. <laughs> well, I've got to go back to the office. Anybody going my way? Yes, I am. <laughs> I've got to go, too. I've got a date. See you later, fella. Find out anything? Plenty, Chief. I found a place where they've been cooking a roast lamb. You don't say. Believe it or not, but I've just been sitting in at your wake. Where were they holding the services? Right where you had the hunch in the Club Bohem Bar. Tony Marlowe gave the order for your execution and Bob Littell us to do the trigger work. We've got to teach this syndicate a lesson they won't forget for a while. Now, bud, this ain't no stick-up. What do you want? Come on, let's take a walk. Want to borrow your camp for a little while, buddy? Do you mind? Well, why pick on me? I never did you no harm. No one's gonna do you any harm if you don't get too curious. Come on, let's go. You're sweet, Trixie. One of these days we're gonna get married. Huh? When, Tony? Oh, soon I'll have a flock of dough, salt it away, and we'll blow this town. Why wait, darling? I'd love you if you didn't have a dime. It'll be a long wait, the way the rackets are paying off now. Well, <laughs> good night, dear. See you tomorrow. And be careful, won't you? I'm always careful, of course. Good you know night. that.
Get in, Tony. I want to have a little talk with you. Huh. Okay, bud. Nice night, isn't it? Do you mind telling me what it's all about? Not at all. I hear you've been giving out some hot tips to the horses. I thought maybe you can give me some. Somebody's been giving you the wrong steer. I never played the ponies. Stop I... stalling. I'm talking about the five grand tip you gave out tonight. Maybe this will refresh your memory. I see you recognize your handwriting. Well, how much you want, Bugs? Name your price and I'll get it for you. Only just give me a break. Danny and Dutch didn't get a break. Somebody wrote their names on a piece of paper. Well, you... You wouldn't give me the works without... giving me a chance to explain, would you? You wouldn't... Well, maybe that could be arranged. Providing you'll do exactly what I say. Well, I'll do anything you want. I'll do... Then uh, shut up! Until we get to where I'm taking you. There, Tony. Sit down and make yourself at home. Now, Tony, you can pay the first installment on your life insurance. I want you to phone Bob or tell him, tell him to meet you in a half hour at the corner of 3rd and Garfield. Yeah, but well, that'll be putting a finger on a friend. You catch on fast. I'm paying off a bet, Tony. To you or Bob Littell? Which do you prefer? Tony, what's giving out? I want to get a message to Bob Littell. Do you know where he is? Sure, I can get a message to him. What is it? Third and Garfield, huh? Okay, Tony. Goodbye. so nervous about, Tony. They're not coming for you. What's new, Lou? Anything interesting been happening? Not much. Oh, yeah, a guy by the name of Latell got gunned on the corner of 3rd and Garfield. Can you imagine that? Who? Bugs Kelly. I'll quit your kidding. I'm not kidding, Barry. I just called up to tell you that Bob Littell lost the five grand bet Tony Marlowe placed with you. I wish these hoodlums would be more considerate and do their killings at a reasonable hour so us reporters could get some sleep. It's tough on you guys. Why don't you join the homicide squad? Do you suppose this Littell killing has got anything to do with the rub out at Smitty's? No, Littell was only a petty larceny hood. The guys that got it at Smitty's were big stuff. Say, what do you think about it, Jim? You got any ideas? I think there's a connection. I'm convinced that crime in our city is incorporated like any big business. Uh... If you know so much about it, why don't you write a book? That's just what I'm going to do, if I ever get time. Did you get the thing on that third and Garfield kill? Not much. A two-bit gunman, Robert Littell, caught three slugs of lead from a person to persons unknown. Just another gang reprisal killing. But I got onto something that's really something. I'll show you my lead as soon as I phone the city morgue.
Hello. Stacy? Jim Riley speaking. I'm looking for a body. Male, about 5 feet 10, weighed 185 pounds, wearing a tux with a flower in the lapel. No soap, huh? I'm much obliged, pal. No, I'm not giving out any hints this season. Good right. I got your message about 5 a.m. How do you expect me to keep up my social obligations when you guys keep me up all night looking at stiffs? <laughs> What's on your mind? Well, I'd like you to do me a little favor, Jim. I'd like you to accompany me on a little trip to Atlantic City. It's a personal matter that's important to me. I'd like to, Bugs, but there's a certain story that's about to bust in my face and my boss might object. Well, what's the story about? Maybe I can help you out. Well, there's a certain big shot proprietor of the Drink, Dine, and Dance Emporium who took an unwilling taxi ride this morning. And his close friends are wondering what the fare is going to be to get him back. Seems to me I heard something about that. Say, how would you like an exclusive on how that story's going to end? How would I like to? Say, uh, when do we start on that trip you mentioned? Okay. I know we're bound for Atlantic City, but what are we going to do when we get there? Well, I'm hoping you'll do me a big personal favor, pal. And if you do, I'll give you the new story of the year. Well, can't you give me a hint right now? Well, I suppose it would be worth something to you, wouldn't it? To know who's back of the crime syndicate? Would it? You know, I'd write a book. Bugs, I wouldn't be able to thank you enough. I'll show you how you can when we get to Atlantic City. And uh, where we're going, don't call me Bugs. It's Mike Egan, my real name. Sweet surrender. My alibi is your touch, so tender.
What are you thinking about, Jim? You've been a clam for 25 miles at least. Oh, I was just thinking about Betty. She's a wonderful girl, Bugs. You think she's pretty nice, huh? That isn't a half of it. Well, she's freed and over 21. And, Jim, you're okay with me. Thanks. When are you going to Frisco? Well, that was just a stall. You see, I nearly got burned up last night. You nearly got burned up, huh? There, see what a close call I had? This was the order for my execution. Who ordered your execution? The operator of a popular night spot. Tony Marlowe, huh? Well, I can tell you this much. Tony Marlowe is one of the big shots of Crime Incorporated. And the deceased Bob Battelle was hired to do the trigger work on you? Is that a good guess? Could be. But you can't prove it by him. That's why you grabbed Tony Marlowe. So you could sweat the names of the other big shots out of him, huh? How am I doing? Well, I know the fellows have picked him up, but I'm not giving out the names. But there's a rumor around that'll cost the syndicate a hundred grand to get him back. It must be a big shot if they want to pay that much for him. Right. And it's my guess it'll be a bigger shot who'll do the paying off. Maybe the top man of Crime Incorporated. are perfectly clear, I presume? Yes, sir. Very well, then, we'll proceed. Mr. Kelly, these three men were shot to death within the last 72 hours. What do you know about it? What I read in the papers. They were executed by gangland order, weren't they? Were they? Cripe and Denton were your employees, weren't they? No, sir. Somebody's been giving you a wrong steer. Oh, stop lying, Kelly. Even the school kids know that they were your trigger men. Then why don't you question the school kids, Mr. Foreman? Isn't it a fact that these killings occurred because an organization of racketeers made overtures to you to join with them and you refused? I don't know what you're talking about. I quote from the crime reporter in a recent issue of the Daily News. I understand that the debonair operator of one of our swankiest night spots took an unexpected taxi ride this morning and is being detained for reasons which will probably soon become known to his associates. Unquote. What do you know about that, Mr. Kelly? Why don't you ask Jim Riley? It was his story, not mine. That's what we intend to do, but while you're here and under oath, do you happen to know the identity of this night spot operator and those who detained him? I suppose you'll even deny that you're a racketeer. I wouldn't bother to deny it. You gentlemen wouldn't believe me if I did. Just what do you do for a living, Mr. Kelly? I'm a life insurance agent. <laughs> My office is at 8457 Canal Street, in case you're ever in that neighborhood. Do any of you gentlemen of the jury wish to continue the questioning? I don't. That's all, Kelly. Thank you, gentlemen. We have just time for a short recess before the police bring over our next witness, Adolf Lutz. We're not going to let a thing happen to you. Hey, try that hotel across the street. That shot could have come from one of those upper windows. Yes, Captain. Come here. Shot. I'm dying. I knew they'd get me if I talk. Uh, take it easy, Lutz. You're not dying. You're just nicked in the shoulder. Uh, get the ambulance, please. Yes, Captain. Thank you, Captain. Gentlemen, I have some disappointing news for you. The witness we were expecting was just shot at the very entrance to this building. Oh, was he killed? No, thank heaven, but he's so terrified he won't be any use to us as a witness. Who shot him? The police don't know. They never know anything. Well, I know one thing, gentlemen. This proves there's a leak in the police department. There sure is. And if the invisible government we're fighting is more powerful than law enforcement, we're wasting our time. You're right. We might as well abandon our crime inquiry. Yeah. Gentlemen, right. please. Right. Look, I agree with you. These hoodlums do seem to have a temporary advantage over us, but I promise you we'll lick them. The decent people of this city are counting on us to fight these crooks to a finish. And gentlemen, that's just what I intend to do so long as there's a breath of life in my body. Dixon is right, gentlemen. We have a sworn duty to perform, so let's do it no matter what happens. Now, uh, let's adjourn until tomorrow morning and get a fresh start. Not a bad idea at all. Come in. 
here early today. What happened? One of the jurors have a tummy ache? <laughs> no. They called a recess because a scheduled witness got shot as the cops were bringing him in. What witness? A waiter at Smitty's Cafe called Adolf Lutz. Another murder, huh? No, he was only wounded. Ah, an old gag called intimidation. Yeah. Here's today's transcript. Oh, thanks, pal. Thanks. Uh, I, I wouldn't be doing this, Jim, but uh, I got myself into a jam a while back and... Yeah, I know how it is. I've been in a lot of those jams myself. Well, I gotta run, Jim. I'll be seeing you. Okay, pal. If I don't get word from Tony pretty soon, that Trixie dame's gonna drive me nuts. Get your feet off the desk. I'm calling every five minutes. What's Bugs waiting for? He knows he'll get paid off. Putting a squeeze on is as much pleasure for him as collecting the bill. Come in. Messenger just brought this for you. This is it, boys. My dear Barry, if you'd like to have the handsome Tony back in the syndicate, this taxi fare will cost you a hundred grand. A hundred grand? He must think that mower grows on trees. Tony ain't worth a hundred grand. Wait a minute, there's more to it. I'll give you 24 hours to raise the cabbage and you'd better kick through. Bugs. P.S. He isn't fooling. Tony. Well, what do we do now? This is too big for me to handle. I've got to go see a certain party. Stick around, boys. I'll be back shortly. It's Trixie again. Tell her everything's under control. I'll call her back later. It's time to contact the syndicate. Where's that phone number I got from Tony Marlowe? Oh, Come here and get an earful, Jim. Hello? Pat Coyle speaking. This is Bugs Kelly, Pat. Well, well, Mr. Kelly. What could I do for you? If you've got that hundred grand handy, I'll come over there and collect it. Mm -hmm. As counsel for Mr. Marlowe, that matter has received my attention. The funds you speak of are in my possession. However, I must have your assurance that my client will be returned safe and sound. Oh, yes, I'll take your word for it. When may I expect you? I'll be there in 20 minutes. And you can tell your syndicate trigger to lay off. If there's any funny business, the joke will be on Mr. Marlowe. Syndicate? Triggerman? I don't know what you mean, Mr. Kelly. Are you kidding? Holy mackerel, Coyle. I just as soon believe the police commissioner was mixed up in this. But maybe Coyle is only acting as Tony's lawyer. Uh, use your head, Jim. Pat Coyle's a syndicate big shot, and you can go to sleep on that. Well, I guess this will hold a hundred grand. <laughs> will you give me a lift, Jim? Sure. Sit down when I got the money for you. Oh, <laughs> there we are. One hundred thousand. I guarantee it. I'll take your word for it. Good. Oh, by the way, there's a friend of Tony's here that'd like to speak to you. Of course, it's up to you. Okay, I'll listen then. I'll show him in. Well, what do you want? I want to talk a little sense into that thick skull of yours. I'm listening. You haven't a chance of fighting the syndicate. You might as well commit suicide. Yeah? Yeah. So why don't you join up with us? We can use you and your mob. You could cut yourself in for a nice slice of the profits. But even let you keep the hundred grand as a bonus. Do I look that, um... Sure. You'd like me to join up so you know where to put the finger on me. And some nice night, I'd walk into an ambush and get blown apart. Good night, Barry. See you at the morgue. No go, huh? No. Yeah, uh, thought he wouldn't fall for it. He's too smart. We'll get him later. As soon as Tony gets back. Well, Tony, you're back in circulation. 
pleasant dreams. Undercover in a place like this gives me the creeps. Nobody would think of looking for his way out here. Why don't you stop bothering me? Can't you see I'm reading a terrific book? Oh, why can't we go out on the avenue, have a couple of beers or something? Okay. I suppose you want to ride on the merry-go-round, too. I like merry-go-rounds. Okay, Junior, let's go. Okay. Now, folks, I want you to step inside, see some of the famous and some of the infamous men and women of history. I want you to step inside and see the Chamber of Horrors, some of the torture implements used in the Inquisition. And, folks, I want you, above all things, to see some of the devices used in capital punishments. Hand me that, will you please, dear? There, my friends, you are looking at what is known as the Oregon boot. That, my friends, is used in transporting dangerous criminals from place to place to keep them from escaping. All right, step here and get your tickets ready. Oh, this ought to be exciting. Maybe we ought to go and learn something. Yeah, maybe we got the wrong slant on things. <laughs> Someone say she was Portia. Portia? What a mouthpiece that dame was. What mob did she front for? Oh, you dope. Didn't you ever read Shakespeare? Oh. <laughs> hey. I'm awfully sorry. It's all right. Hey. I've always wondered what it would feel like to sit in the old hot seat. No, don't, Bugs. It's bad luck. Ah, uh, don't be silly. I ain't gonna die in the electric chair. <laughs> Jim Riley speaking. Oh, hello, boss. How's crime? Jim, I've got some news for you. Bugs just got knocked off. What's that? No. Yeah, I just got the flash from Coney Island. And here's one for the book. Bugs met his death in the electric chair at the waxworks. Yeah, 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 I heard what you said. It knocked me for a loop, although I've been expecting it. No, I won't shed any tears. Yeah, he was a cold-blooded killer, yeah. Deserved what he got. Yeah, yeah. But, boss, not at the hands that dealt it to him. Well, perhaps you're right, Jim, but I thought maybe you wanted to handle the story. Well, sure, I'd like to. for Miss Betty Van Cleve. Do you know where I could find her? Miss Van Cleve moved away from here yesterday. You know where she went? No. She uh, was very much in a hurry and she didn't leave a forwarding address. I'm sorry. So am I. Thank you. There's no luck, huh? No. Nope. Gee, that's tough. Where do you want to go now? Back to New York City. And, uh... Take these home to the little woman. Gee, that's swell. Thanks.
there's one of them. I'm sure that's one of them. That's the other one. They're the ones that did the shooting, all right. I know the mugs. Got anything on them? Nothing lately, but I understand Gar hangs out at a bookmaker's place on the west side. Stuck us in the number racket uptown. Collins speaking. Send out a teletype order to pick up Judd Stecker and Eddie Gar, murder suspects. Thanks a lot to both of you. You've been a great help to us. Can we go home? Yes, I'll have one of my men take you. Now, don't tell anybody what you know about the crime. Not even your own families. We won't. Take them home, Hayes. Yes, Commissioner. Yeah? One of them coppers is on the wire. Okay. Barry speaking. Yeah, what's on your mind? How long ago? Have you got the names and addresses? All right, give them to me. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Thanks for the tip. You know who. Now get this. Find Stecker and Gar and tell them there's a pickup order out for them. Yeah, and there's a couple of witnesses we may have to take care of. Yeah, I'll give you the names and addresses. Here they are, Commissioner. What do you know? We bagged them just as they were getting ready to leave town. And they must have just been paid for the job they did. You ain't got nothing on us. We want this dough in the dice game. Sure. We want to see our lawyer before you start kicking us around. Oh, stop beeping. You'll get to see your lawyer. But first, I've got a couple of witnesses. I want to identify you. Book them for murder, Captain. Just in case some crooked mouthpiece tries to get them out on a writ. Take them, boys. Come on, boys. Come on. You've got to register when you stay at this hotel. My congratulations to the department commissioner. You mean that? Sure. Read my column in tomorrow's Daily News. You come in. Hello, Jim. How are you? Here's yesterday's transcript. This will keep you up to date. Okay. Thanks. Today's proceedings were the worst yet with Dixon out of town. You got bored, so we had to take a vacation, huh? <laughs> no. Eddie Gar sent word through his old lady that he wanted to talk. So Dixon trained up to the big house last night. Oh? You don't know what Gar wanted to talk about, do you? No, but I guess he's finding prison life too confining, and he wanted to cry on Dixon's shoulder. Well, I'm anxious to find out what they talk about. So if you find out, I'll wangle you a little bonus money. Okay. Naturally, I'm interested in getting the lowdown on the killing of Bugs Kelly and his henchmen. But I want you to understand that nothing you say will alter the sentence the court gave you. I have no bargain to offer you. Yeah, I know, I know. Did you hear that? Hear what? That voice. Keeps whispering all the time. Don't be a big sucker, Eddie. There's another one. Saying the same thing. Don't be a sucker and take the rap, Eddie. When the guy who hired you to cool bugs is strutting around having a good time. But who followed that gang to Coney Island, huh? I did. Who gave him a dose of lead? I did. Who took the manslaughter rap? I did. Who's making a sucker out of me? Tony Marlowe. You mean to say that Tony Marlowe hired you to cool Bugs Kelly? Of course he did. He's the finger man for the syndicate, ain't he? Is he? That's what I said, didn't I? Oh, I know, I know. He takes the orders from someone higher up, but he's the guy who says who does it to who and for how much. <laughs> if you put those notes in the form of a statement, I'll have Eddie sign it. Yes, sir. Huh? What'd you say? Yeah. Right, uh, yeah. Hello, Mr. Marlowe, please. Hello, Tony, this is Lucas. Yeah, listen, I gotta see you right away. 
I'll say it's important. Okay. You're as nervous as a cat. What's the matter, pal? I... I've got some information for you this time that ought to be worth five thousand dollars. Five grand? It's gotta be good at worth that kind of dough. Give me a little hint. Dixon went up to the state prison last night and he's on his way back with plenty of dynamite. Now you give. Listen, Eddie Garblew was topper and gave Dixon the details of the Bugs Kelly rubout, naming you the finger man. Now if you hurry, you'll have time to get undercover. So Dixon's coming back tonight, huh? Yeah, he's getting off the train at Wayside. I'm driving his car up to meet him. Nice going, Lucas. I told you if you play ball with me, you get yourself a bankroll. Now be careful when you go out. See that no one sees you. Goodbye and good luck. Goodbye and thanks. So he's getting off at Wayside, eh? <laughs> Jim Riley speaking. Oh, hello, pal. Say, I was just talking to Dixon, long distance. Whatever made you suspect that Eddie Gar might have something important to tell him? <laughs> Did he sing? The lid's off, Jim. Dixon's on his way back with a briefcase full of dynamite. Now wait, where can I go to see the show? I wouldn't want to miss this for anything in the world. You might blow yourself to a feat at the Club Boheme around 7.30 p.m., if you know what I mean. I might at that. Thanks a million until I can reciprocate more grandiferously. Right. Table for two. Hello, Jim. Hiya, Tony. Uh, Living in the lap of luxury, I suppose, huh? Could it be that my favorite crime reporter is taking the fall out of the old expense account? Could be. <laughs> Take it easy. Ladies and gentlemen, for your pleasure, a new entertainer, and one I know you're going to like, Miss Betty Van Cleve. In a nightclub, take pictures galore. Although it's a bright club, to me it's a bore. When a man gives my hand a squeeze, I smile and say, Your picture, please. My hours are long here, commissions are slight. I'm crying my song here, the same every night. There's a hymn on a limb with a herd. Sign your picture, sir. Oh, that smile, just watch the birdie. Catch that style, and she's way past 30. See those older, dignified men. Comes in a folder, looks good in your den. See that youngster on his very first date. A picture is fun, sir. Done while you wait. Oh, what a mixture! They give me no rest. Order a picture for the folks out west. Though I dance around, there's no romance around. How I hate this posing from nine till close. Take your picture, hoping that one night the man who is bright will come along to claim his pearl and carry off the lonely little camera
gorgeous. Just what the doctor ordered. I want to send a little note to Miss Betty Van Cleve. We'll do for a buck. We'll do if you buy a pack of cigarettes. You're a sweet child. <laughs> There. And if you bring back her answer, I can keep the change. Hello, Grace. Here's enough for you, Miss Van Cleef. Not to wait for an answer. Well. May I borrow your pencil? Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Well, well, a nice note for your first song, huh? Not at all. The gentleman's an old friend of the family. <laughs> That's what they all say. You know, I never was so surprised in my life as when Eddie Gar began to hear those imaginary voices. I never dreamed a cold-blooded killer like him would crack so quickly under confinement. I guess prisons are no fun. No. What I've got in here will definitely put Tony Marlowe in the electric chair. And maybe some of our distinguished citizens. You don't say. We've been blind as bats. And here's Jim Riley trying to tell us all along that crime and racketeering were controlled by a syndicate. We paid no attention to it. And I'm ashamed to say there are indications that even Pat Coyle is mixed up in this. Detour to roadside. Thanks. you took from the chump of the spectacle. Of course, I thought it was a little bonus for us. Bonus, my eye. You boys are getting paid enough as it is. Come on, give. Get in there. You're under arrest, Tony. What have I been doing now? Parking in front of a fire plug? Charges conspiracy to commit murder. <laughs> Quit your kidding. We're not kidding, Tony. Get your hat. Oh, wait a minute. If you take me on such a ridiculous charge, I'll sue the city of a false arrest. Come on, Tony. What are you... You guys... What is your full name and address? Anthony Charles Marlowe, 88 Broadway. Just a minute. I want to protest my client's arrest on such a preposterous charge. Before you book him, I demand that you be used evidence to support the charge. We'll have plenty, Mr. Coyle. As soon as Mr. Dixon gets back in town, He's due any minute now. I want it on the phone, Commissioner. It's a uh, long distance. Thank you. I'll take that long distance call, Murphy. Hello. Colin speaking. Who? Oh, yes, yes. What's that? No. Where did it happen? I see. Hold the phone a minute. I'll have someone take down the details. Don't answer another question until they produce some proof to back their charge. Go ahead, Sergeant. We know what we're doing. If you do, Sergeant, I'll serve you with a writ. So fast you hit a swim. We'll have to turn Mr. Marlowe loose, boys. We have no evidence now to back up his arrest. What do you mean, no evidence? You said the deputy DA was bringing it with him. He was. But he and his secretary were murdered on their way here and the evidence stolen. I'll bet that Marlowe knew that Dixon was dead when we arrested him. But we've no way of proving it. He knew all right. Likely as not, he gave the order to kill Dixon. Which means we've got a leak in the department. Come in. I'd like to offer a suggestion if it's in order. Come in, Jim. We can use a suggestion. Don't you think it would be a good idea if you had the warden of the state prison keep an eye on Gar until you can send somebody up there to question him? How did you know that Gar did any singing? 
What difference does it make who told him? Get me Warden Monaghan as quick as you can. Duffy Warden wants 105, 438 right away. Katie Gore. Yeah, he's inside. Where's Eddie Garns? One up front. He went in the storeroom to get some sugar. Should I, huh? I wouldn't know. Five grand. Hey, Eddie. Chief School wants to see you. Hey, Eddie. Wake up. Hey, somebody! Eddie, that's the murder! And when my book comes off the press in a week or two, I'm going to give each one of you guys a copy. Well, that'll be swell, Jim. We'd be glad to read it. Colin speaking. Oh, hello, Monaghan. What's that? The invisible government has beaten us to the punch again. Somebody just drove a knife through Eddie Gar's heart. Yeah, boss, that's right. Guy got it in the back, in the prison storeroom. Yeah. Right. I've been waiting for you. I'm sorry. It's a little late to be calling on anybody. I know. You had to cover the arrest of Tony Marlowe. Everybody at the club boy was talking about it. Well, that certainly turned out to be a fizzle. But uh, let's talk about you. What was the idea of running away without leaving a forwarding address? You know, I was up there to see you. I'm sorry I missed you, Jim, but... But what? Well, I might as well tell you and save you from any embarrassment. I know about my brother's death. He came up to see me about a week before he died, and he told me everything. Naturally, I was shocked. I never knew he went by the name of Bugs Kelly. I never dreamed I was the sister of a murderer. I'm sorry, Jim. Tell me the truth. You came to Atlantic City that night because Mike made you. You agreed to be friendly with me because you were afraid he'd say no. You've got it all wrong, Betty. Oh, you don't have to pretend anymore. You can bow out if you want to. It won't hurt my feelings. Betty. Now listen to me. I love you. You hear? Gentlemen, as you all know, the purpose of this meeting is to form a secret committee to fight organized crime. And I mean wipe it out of our city once and for all. And we have to clean our own house, too. I hate to think that Dixon was murdered because someone in the department was a traitor to the cause of justice. But what else can I think? The public is up in arms, and rightfully so. Now, we've got to put an end to this crime wave or resign and let others more capable do the job. Now, which is it going to be, men? We'll, we'll clean it up, Chief. We'll we'll clean it up, Chief. Gentlemen. As Jim Riley would say, this meeting of the Board of Directors of Crime Incorporated is now open for business. <laughs> However, as chairman in the absence of our president, I want to sound a timely warning. We can't afford to have any more violence. Since it became necessary to eliminate the Bugs Kelly mob, our business has fallen off 16%. 
Mr. North, until public indignation dies down, I think you should have all marble games removed from school neighborhoods and operate bookmaking at a cover for a while. That goes for policy games and baseball pools as well. And during the lull, let's try and dig up some new competitive game, something different. It'll bring us a few nickels. Oh. Excuse me. What can I do for you? <laughs> what can I do for you? I'm Jim Riley. Fine. Here's a little present for you. I'm a process server from the grand jury. <laughs> I have here a book entitled Crime Incorporated by Jim Riley. Are you that Jim Riley? I am. Assuming that the material in your book is factual, just how were you able to get information when all the city law enforcement groups were unable to get it? I don't know. Maybe because I had better contacts. <laughs> better contacts? Isn't it a fact that you got most of your information from Bugs Kelly? Yes, so what? So you admit more than a speaking acquaintance with a dirty killer. I can't testify as to how often Kelly took a bath, if that's what you mean. You know what I mean. You probably know him well enough to get a regular cut from his racket. That statement's a lie. I don't have to defend my relations with Kelly, but it's fortunate there was such a man as Kelly. He was a killer, sure, but who made him a killer, I'll tell you. An organization of racketeers and greedy businessmen who formed a syndicate to monopolize all illegitimate business and sources of graft. Bugs wouldn't line up with them. Bugs' futile fight to stay independent is the reason that you're here, gentlemen. He has unwittingly done more to clean up our city than all the law enforcement agencies because his activity laid bare the existence of incorporated crime. Mm. Now, if you're through theorizing, Mr. Riley, this grand jury would like to know just why Kelly gave you information. Because I did him a favor. What was that favor, Mr. Riley? It's something personal, so it doesn't concern the grand jury. The material in your book concerns the grand jury. And it's your civic duty to help wage war against crime. Sure, and get myself riddled with bullets. <laughs> I'm sorry, gentlemen, I'm not that civic-minded. You're going to talk, Mr. Riley, or we're going to ask the court to question you. We want the full details of your investigations. We want the right names of the people mentioned in your book. And we want the addresses of all the rackets. And you're going to answer those questions right now. I'm sorry, gentlemen. The confidence between a news reporter and his source of information is just as sacred as the confidence between doctor and patient, lawyer and client, or priest and penitent. Riley, we'll give you 24 hours to think it over. And bear in mind, your continued defiance will render you liable to a charge of contempt. You're dismissed. Thank you, Mr. Conway. Hello, Jim. Well, you don't look so happy. The grand jury been giving you the works. Yeah, I gotta go back and answer some questions or else. Maybe you'd rather talk to me. You know me better than that. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. I want you to join our secret committee for driving the rats out of town. Who's on the committee? Just a few of the men we can trust, like Ferroni, Finch, Westover, and the foreman of the grand jury. Clark? Yeah. You see the point? If you join our committee, the jury will have to lay off you. <sighs> yeah, I see the point. And uh, you might be needing some protection for that charming young lady you've been calling on at a late hour. What charming young lady? When she attended public school number nine, her name was Betty Egan. Catch on? Well, I uh, guess I'll join your committee. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome into the fold, Jeff. Oh, uh, I read your book last night, and I was able to identify quite a few of the characters. Now, tell me if I'm wrong. 
Tony Marlowe was finger man for the syndicate? And one of the big shots. And Barry North's the payoff man. For the small jobs, like killing competition. Well, just where does Pat Coyle fit into the picture? He could be the president or the chairman of the board, since he paid Bugs Kelly a hundred grand for the life of Tony Marlowe. Oh, so that's how it was. Got any leads we can follow up? Yeah, I've got a couple of leads, but it will require uh, dictaphones and camera traps. Well, this is not an ethical fight. What are they? Well, for one, an old reputable firm, National Brokers Incorporated on the sixth floor of the arcade building, which Tony Marlowe finds it necessary to visit now and then. And another hits pretty close to home. Let's hear it. Well, some of your force have been making calls on the International Export Company on the fifth floor of the arcade building. <laughs> what kind of business would they be wanting with an export company? It's just a front. It's the headquarters of Barry North. Here's a list of the callers. What? Well, these are some of our best men. Naturally. It requires a good man to go crooked and get away with it. Greetings, board members. Greetings, Mr. President. Gentlemen, I have just come from a meeting of the Secret Police Committee, and I am genuinely worried. Jim Riley has become a member of the committee, and there's no telling what he knows of our syndicate activities. What do you propose, Mr. President? I'm afraid it will be necessary to eliminate the Secret Committee. Do you realize what you're proposing? I, for one, can't subscribe to such drastic measures. Nor I. Your suggestion is insane. Perhaps you two gentlemen would prefer the electric chair. Uh, no. Take it easy. Come, gentlemen, we're wasting time. I propose the immediate elimination of Jim Riley and Miss Betty Van Cleve, an entertainer at the Club Boheme. Mr. Cable, will you give us a report on your investigation of Miss Van Cleve? Uh, Betty Van Cleve is just a professional name. She was christened Betty Egan and is a sister of the deceased Bugs Kelly. All those in favor of the elimination say aye. 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 Contrary, no. All right, Tony, matters in your hands. Uh, just a minute, Tony. This can't be the usual gangland rub out. It will have to look like an accident. Okay, I'll have the boys put them in the Riley car and shove them over the Palisades. Jim, I'm scared. Don't be, darling. There's nothing to be afraid of. me from the club. You just imagined it. No. I was expecting I'd be followed. You were expecting to be followed? How come? I suppose it was awfully silly of me, but I listened in on a conversation between Tony Milo and Trixie. Betty. Well, I wanted to help you get something on him. You mustn't take a chance like that. Supposing they found out that Bugs was your brother. I know. It was awful stupid of me, because I got caught. Who caught you? Trixie. From now on, you take care of the singing. I'll take care of the crime detecting. I'm sure we were followed. Yeah. Jim, don't you think? Take it easy now, and you won't get hurt. What do you want? If it's money you expect, I haven't very much. Quiet, sister. This ain't a stick up. What is it then? Somebody wants to have a little talk with you. Now get over there by the wall. Get your arm. What for? Don't oh, your pal. Just do as you're told. Hold it, boys. Drop those rods. Oh yeah. <laughs> Collins speaking. Yeah. Okay. This is it, Peroni. Let's go. So, gentlemen, our next objective is to control the city elections and place our own men in the key positions. Then we shall be impregnable. I propose that... Yes? I see. Nice. 
gentlemen, the meeting is adjourned. We are about to be visited by the law. Well, good evening, gentlemen. What brings you here? As if you didn't know, Mr. Coyle. You're under arrest, all of you. Take him away, boys. Just a minute. Have you a warrant for our arrest? I am. Would you like to see it? No, thanks. I still think this is a gag. What's the charge? There are a number of them, Mr. Coyle, including conspiracy to commit murder. <laughs> now I know it's a gag. Just bring him over to Central. We'll book him. Step this way, gentlemen. Go. All right, man. Come on. And now, Captain Finch, I think it's about time you joined the rest of the rats. Me? You. I'll take your gun if you don't mind. There aren't enough words to express my contempt for a crooked officer. You've got nothing on me. Your partners in crime, Sergeants Busby and Hiss, are already locked in a cell. And I hope that three of you are burned for this. He's only bluffing, Captain. He'll have to release us when he can't produce enough evidence to bind us over for a hearing. You're mistaken this time, Mr. Coyle. In 30 minutes, the evidence will be shown you and the grand jury in Captain Peroni's squad room. Gentlemen of the jury, as district attorney, I'm about to present some evidence collected by our police department in its effort to suppress crime. This is not regular procedure, but I'm going to gamble that it will bring this case to a quick conclusion. You said it, Conroy. It certainly is not a regular procedure. Go ahead, Sergeant. Can you turn out those lights, please? Right. Hello, pal. What brings you out so late at night? I just came from a meeting of a secret police committee. You'd better get the idea out of your head that this committee is a joke like the grand jury. You're breaking my heart. It's on your mind. I want to collect the money I won in the races last week. I don't think you have any deal coming after the way you fell down on the guard and sticker job. That wasn't my fault. I tipped you off in plenty of time. Gentlemen, I have just come from a meeting of the secret police committee and I am genuinely worried. I propose the immediate elimination of Jim Riley and Miss Betty Van Cleve. All in favor of the elimination, say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. All right, Tony, the matter's in your hands. Uh, just a minute, Tony. This car looks like the usual gangland robber. It will have to appear to be an accident. Okay, I'll have the boys put him in the Riley car and shove him over the Palisades. All right, boys. Take the prisoners back to jail. Gentlemen of the jury, in the involuntary absence of our late but unlamented foreman, it becomes my pleasant task to announce to you that you have voted a true bill, charging the entire membership of Crime Incorporated from the highest to the lowest with murder in the first degree. Congratulations, gentlemen. You have rendered our community a most valuable service. I shall proceed at once to prosecute the defendants. We could have been married a dozen times while we've been waiting. I know, darling, but I couldn't ignore a grand jury summons. They threw me in jail. They've got a nerve calling you into court on our wedding day. Maybe they want to save me from a dire fate. Mr. Riley, you may come in now. I'm sorry, darling, you can't come in here. Where you go, I'm going, dear. That's all right. She can come in with you. She can. Sure. Come on, Jim. Hello, Jim. That subpoena was just a gag. The grand jury wants to express its appreciation for your splendid work in helping to fight the invisible government in our city. Was that all you wanted? Why, yes, why? Well, if Betty and I had known that, we uh, could have gotten married before we came over here. What's that? Does somebody want to get married? Is it you, Jim? Well, darling, this is Judge Poole, legal advisor to the grand jury. Judge, this is my wife. Well, I mean my fiance. This is a pleasure, my dear. Well, you have some illustrious witnesses here. Get out the marriage license. Uh, please join hands. We're gathered here to witness the uniting in holy wedlock of James Riley and, and Betty Egan.